I'm so excited to speak with you today. Uh, I am communications manager at a small nonprofit called Book Harvest, which is a nonprofit in Durham dedicated to book abundance and early childhood literacy. So not really in the realm of chemistry and, and science and the medical field that you might be used to. Um, but I'm excited to speak with you today because of your rich history with books, as well as your, your recent publication. But I am fascinated about your childhood relationship with books because you oh, grew yeah. up in the Bronx, raised by an accountant and an elementary school teacher. So you were surrounded by numbers and words. And as an only child, you claim to have sought companionship in the books that filled your home and your local library. You read voluminous biographies before you were even a teen and even faked sick to stay home and read. So my, my question is actually kind of about your parents. I'm curious about how your parents reacted to your love of reading and were they active participants in your obsession? Uh, I don't remember my dad or my mother being the kind of voracious reader that I was. That's the interesting thing. I mean, they, they had a reasonable library uh, in the house. Although when I think of the books that they have, you know, they might have had, I'm just trying to think, maybe they had 100 or 150 books, which filled the only bookshelf, uh, the only bookcase that there was in the small apartment in which we lived. I probably have about 3,000 my wife and I, I would say about 3,000 books in the house. And uh, I mean, what you see behind me is is, is a trivial fraction. Uh, I'm in my study. Uh, it's mostly medical books up here, but the, the real library is downstairs. Uh, but they encouraged it. I mean, they took me to the library uh, and I have so many wonderful memories of the public library, which was only a block from my house. Uh, and I would, even as a child, uh, I would cart out every trip, uh, the maximum, which I still remember was six books, uh, you know, and they, and they would, there was a label in the book and they would, the librarian would take a, a thing and she would stamp the due date that it was due back, you know, and that, that's how you knew when the, when the book was due back. Mm -hmm. But there was a children's section uh, and then the rest of the library. And I remember to this day, although I, I don't remember how old I was, but you had to be like, I don't know, 10, oh, I'm making that up, years old, some age to uh, be permitted into the main part of the library. Prior to that, you were basically penned up in the children's section. And I still remember the day when I passed that birthday uh, and I was allowed to go into the main library and it was, I, I still remember wandering around uh, and looking at all the different sections, you know, identified. And I was just, I remember, I didn't want to go home when my mother, she would leave me there. And then she'd come back to walk me home. Uh, and I didn't want to go, go with her. I said, I, I, I need more time here. Uh, so yeah, I mean, I adored books. And you read about how I used to, you know, sign my parents up for these book clubs. Uh, which was a great trick. I did that, I think, three separate times. And I still have, uh, right here, I'm, 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 the, these are the actual volumes. So one set uh, was Winston Churchill's six volume history of the, uh, Second World War. This is volume one of the six. The whole set is down there called The Gathering Storm. I've read this twice, once as a child, once as an adult. Uh, and I see it came out in 1948. So I was five then. I probably got it when I was maybe 12. Uh, but and then this was another set that I got uh, by Winston Churchill, The History of the English Speaking Peoples. Uh, it's a four volume set. Uh, let's see when this came out. Uh, this came out in 1958, so I would have been 15. I think I must have gotten this when it just came out. Uh, so you would get these free sets and then trick your parents into having to pay for the rest of them? Yeah, so then they were stuck. Once I, I, I got the free sets, uh, and, and then they had to, they were signed up automatically to buy three, five volumes in the next year. 
Uh, and there was no way out of that contract. And of course, they would let me pick them. Uh, and, you know, they never really disciplined me for this. Uh, and they sort of, uh, you know, they tried to show that it was not a good thing to do to go behind their back, you know, blah, blah, blah. But uh, I could tell that secretly they were just as delighted. I remember uh, the third book club that I joined, I got uh, Carl Sandburg's I think it was five volume biography of Abraham Lincoln. Mm -hmm. uh, so this is what I was reading as a young teenager. <laughs> well, I mean, speaking of having a home library and reading all these books, Book Harvest programming is based on the evidence that having a home literacy environment dramatically increases a child's ability to succeed and in school and in life. And literally just the simple presence of books in a home instills a love of learning, curiosity, vocabulary from a young age. So as someone who grew up with and continues to have an expansive home library, tell me why you prioritize having physical books in your home. Why I prioritize it? Mm -hmm. Well, I, I certainly uh, no longer have young children at home. And even, even when I was raising my own five children, what seems like many, many years ago, uh, I don't think I had books in the home it never occurred to me that uh, I had books, you know, to encourage them to read. It was just they always were surrounded by books. And no, none of my five children went into science. Uh, in fact, they're more in the arts than in science. But every one of them is a, a voracious reader, a voracious reader. Uh, in fact, I remember during the summers, uh, I used to, I had forgotten this until we're having this conversation. Uh, completely. I haven't thought about this in decades. I, I had a, a standing offer, which all the kids took me up on in their time, where over the summer, uh, dad would pay you a dollar a book for any book that you read. Okay. Uh, but the minimum was 10. So in other words, if you read nine books, you got nothing. If you got 10, you got $10. Uh, and, up, and up from there. Uh, and they never snookered me, as best I could tell. It, it was supposed to be kind of an honor system, but I would quiz them from time to time because many of the books they chose to read uh, were books that I had read. Uh, so I knew something about them and I would engage them in discussion. Uh, but why do I have all these books? Uh, and, you know, even now in the era of uh, Kindle, uh, and audio books, most of the books that I buy, 90, 95% uh, are still physical books. Uh, and it's as simple as this. I love it. I love having the book in my hand. Uh, and my, uh, what do they say? My reach is more than my grasp uh, in the sense that I, I buy too many books that I cannot possibly read. Uh, if I was on my nightstand, there are currently six or eight books, uh, and maybe two of them I'm destined to read to the end. And you might say, well, why don't you finish them? Because there are always more coming in. Uh, okay. So, uh, yeah, I mean, I just, there's something about books and I guess this goes back to my childhood. I mean, I was an only child. I was alone a lot. Uh, and because, you know, my mother worked at teaching school uh, and of course my father worked as an accountant. And so I was alone a lot. And what did I do? I read. Uh, and, uh, you know, that, that's as true today. If, uh, you know, I'm not retired at all. I'm still at 78. I'm still working full time. Uh, the only thing that tempts me at all in the direction of retirement is the opportunity to spend more time reading because I'm, you know, I'm still running a research group of about 15 people uh, and, you know, writing papers and mm -hmm. it, it takes a huge chunk of my time and other professional activities. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, the only thing I find tempting about it at all is the idea of uh, having more time to catch up on, on all these books that I've been surrounding myself with all these years.
Well, I want to go back to that, what you're currently reading, because we asked you some pre questions and you gave such a diverse list of what you're currently reading. You listed a biography, book of poetry, book about mathematics, Plato's Republic, and even Agatha Christie. So I am curious about your reading habits and whether you just pick up a, a book and read a piece at a time, depending on your mood. Yeah, I, th I think the mood has a lot to do with it. Uh, as you, my, my tastes are and always have been very eclectic. I'm an, I'm an extraordinarily curious people, uh, person, so that every, everything interests me. Uh, now, there are certain themes. For example, the book on my nightstand right now that I am most likely to finish is also the thickest book. It's a, a comprehensive 1,000 page biography of uh, Winston Churchill. So you see the Churchill theme goes back to when I was a kid. Uh, and I love Winston Churchill. This book is not by him, it's about him. And I'm 500 pages into the thousand. So uh, I'm, I'm in a good place with that. But uh, I never read, take Agatha Christie. Uh, I never had read anything by Agatha Christie, but my wife is a huge fan uh, and has literally read uh, the entire oeuvre, uh, like whatever, 150 books or something. And I was sorry when she finished it because it gave me every year a, an ironclad automatic gift idea uh, for her birthday and for Christmas. Uh, <clears throat> and I would just buy her Agatha Christie books, initially uh, collections of six novels, uh, but when I exhausted what was available in that format, I went to the individual books. So we had the entire oeuvre uh, in our library, but I had never read any. I don't know, I guess about a year ago, I forget what was going on. I had some illness that laid me up for, uh, for a bit, uh, so I had more time to read. So I picked one up. Next thing I knew, I was hooked. I read about eight of them back to back, uh, and that phase ended. <laughs> Not going to okay. make it 150. <laughs> right, exactly. There was too much else to read. Uh, what else did I put on that list? Um, well, actually, you said you were reading a book of poetry written by your medical colleague, which I'm very curious about. Do you remember the title of that? Yeah, so I'll tell you about that. So I've had a number of interesting experiences uh, wherein uh, colleagues from other institutions or my own institution, college classmates, high school classmates have read my book uh, and they uh, reach out to me to tell me how much they enjoy it. And some of these per people turn out to be authors. They say, oh, you might enjoy my book. Well, one guy whose name is Barry Zaret, Z-A-R-E-T, a couple of years older than me, I think he's 80. Uh, not, not a guy that I knew well, uh, but I would see him once a year at some of the professional meetings. We would jog together. I probably have not seen or thought of him in 20 years at least. Uh, so he reached out to say how much he loved my book. And so we started corresponding. I asked what he was doing. He's retired. And it turns out he has talents. Uh, unrelated to the medical profession, he's both a painter and he writes poetry. Uh, he said, you might enjoy one of my books. He says, I've written three books uh, of poetry. I said, well, to be honest with you, I never read poetry, I said, uh, because I don't get it. Uh, I said, when I read, I want to just relax and enjoy it. And the idea of having to read very closely and figure out, you know, every word and what it meant, I said, it's not for me. He says, well, I, some of my poetry is very, very accessible, he says. You might try one of my books. I said, well, what's the most accessible? And I think the, the title is something like, When You've Given All You Can Give, something along those lines. If you want to look it up, just look up Zaret, Z-A-R-E-T. So I bought myself a copy, and it's a thin book of poetry, maybe 100 pages, uh, and I'm almost finished with it. And, you know, he was absolutely right. I'm really enjoying it. Uh, a lot of it relates to his medical experiences uh, and some of the what it's like to lose patients, 
uh, and to deal with very, very sick people, both in your own practice and in your family. And all of that really spoke to me. So I must say, I've really, in, it's the first book of poetry I probably ever read since I got out of school. Wow. Yeah. I I just, he's able to cross those disciplines and, and make something like that. Very ve unusual. And as someone who is a multi multidisciplinary in yourself and you engage with others who are similar, I actually am wondering if you could share your thoughts on academic silos and maybe the need for more cross-disciplinary collaboration, perhaps not poetry and mathematics, but I mean, you are a medical scientist. What other fields out there should be working together? Well, I think we're in an increasingly interdisciplinary field. Uh, <clears throat> and the silos and specialization and over specialization that we're seeing in the medical profession, I can tell you, is something that I decry and I don't like at all. Uh, but there seems to be no turning back. Uh, medical specialists get more and more specialized. Uh, the same is true in the scientific disciplines as the technologies become more and more complicated, more and more sophisticated. And so people can't get their hands around these technologies and they have to collaborate with other scientists from other disciplines. When I was a young scientist, we typically had uh, three, maybe four authors on a paper. Uh, I wrote as a young scientist, a number of papers where I was the only author mm -hmm. or early in my career, there would be two authors, my trainee or fellow and myself. And then by mid-career, you were seeing many papers that had 10 to 20 authors. Today, uh, I would say 20 is almost the low end of the spec thing in my field. Uh, one routinely sees papers with 30 or more authors because everybody has to collaborate because nobody, no one laboratory or scientist can really claim the expertise in all these fields. In medical practice, it, on the one hand, it helps the patient in that the person they're seeing is a super specialist in the area of their illness. Uh, and so you know the person who's seeing you or cutting on you has done or seen more cases of that than just about anybody else. And that redounds to your benefit. However, in many cases, <clears throat> You don't know what's wrong with the patient. And just because they have pain in their abdomen doesn't mean they need to see a gastroenterologist. It might be pain radiating from somewhere else. It might be an endocrine problem. It might be a cardiac problem, etc. So what do you do then? Uh, before you know what it is, you don't know what specialist to use. And that's when you used to see people called internists. And that's how I was originally trained in internal medicine, also for exceptionally cardiology. So. I remember uh, about oh, five or six years ago, one of my adult children uh, was having a problem with his ankle uh, and a uh, local physician had, uh, he thought he had sprained it, but then a local physician took an x-ray and said, you know, you might have a hairline fracture here in one of the bones of the ankle. <clears throat> you need to see an orthopedist. So I called a medical school classmate of mine uh, who was a very noted uh, orthopedic surgeon in New York City. And I said, could you see my son? For I said, sure, Bob, I'd be happy to do it. What's the problem? And I explained it to him. He says, well, uh, I wouldn't see him myself. Uh, I would get one of my associates to see him. I said, how come? He says, well, I don't, I don't do ankles. I don't see ankles. I said, no kidding. What do you do? And he says, shoulders, only shoulders. To which I responded, right or left? <laughs> He, he didn't seem amused. Uh. Oh, wow. Well, I do want to transition a little bit more back to books here really quick. You obviously wrote that beautiful book behind you called A Funny Thing Happened on the Way to Stockholm, The Adrenaline Fueled Adventures of an Accidental Scientist, which is a great title, by the way. I don't know who came up with that, but it's great. Um, did going through the process of writing a book change the way you read other books? That's a wonderful question. <clears throat> yes, I think so very much. Uh, 
a lot of things I took for granted, uh, I, I now pay closer attention to, you know, would I have said it that way? Uh, <clears throat> would I have put these elements in this book in the same order, uh, emphasis, etc.? The writing of this book was different than most in that it is a particular genre uh, sometimes described as as told to. So I have a co-author uh, and I might tell you a little bit about the genesis of the book. Uh, so I'm known as a bit of a rock on tour. Uh, you're already hearing some of my stories here. Everything reminds me of a story, by the way, uh, and I'm more than happy to tell them as long as I've got a willing or even unwilling audience. Uh, now I've trained uh, something like 250 uh, scientists in my career, still, still at it, uh, and I'm always regaling them with stories. And so for decades, People are saying, Bob, you got to write up your stories. They're so interesting. Many of them are so funny, insightful. You got to do it. I never would have done it. But several years ago, one of my postdoctoral fellows from the 1990s, uh, who's now a professor of pharmacology at Emory University in Atlanta, was up visiting me to go watch a Duke basketball game together. He was a big fan. And over dinner, of course, I was regaling him with stories. And he said, Bob, he says, look, he says, let me pitch something to you. He says, do you know the book by the Nobel Prize winning physicist Richard Feynman called, uh, surely you're joking, Mr. Feynman. I don't know if you ever heard about it. It's a, it's, a, it's in this genre of as told too. He was also a rock on tour. Uh, so he told his stories to uh, one of his former trainees who was by then a professor. Uh, and together they wrote it up. So Randy said, how about this? He says, uh, you tell me your stories uh, over the phone. Uh, I'll record them. Uh, I'll write them up. We'll come up with a narrative structure. Uh, I'll write up your stories from what I hear from you and from the recordings that I'll make. You edit them uh, and we'll see if we can do this. Uh, and so we started and we spent, you know, essentially one calendar year doing it. Uh, we would talk for about two hours a week. He would record everything. We started chronologically when I was a little boy. And I, in advance of each conversation, I would, uh, in a notebook, write down stories that were in my head about that. Uh, and then we just went back and forth on the different chapters. Uh, and we tried to lift any scientific details, for the most part, out of the main text and put them in a chapter note. So the book is completely accessible uh, to lay people. I mean, in fact, it's really directed more at lay people than it is. It's well, certainly directed more at lay people uh, than it is scientists. Uh, so that's how the book came to be. I mean, you, you seem to have a lot of great stories and have read from a lot of incredible authors and including Winston Churchill, like you mentioned before. Um, but you when asked about your favorite quote, you listed one, I believe it's from Faust. Uh, whatever you can do or dream, you can begin it. Boldness has a genius, power, and magic in it. And I, I was listening to one of your speeches, and you described the power of boldness within science. But I'm curious about when this quote became a favorite of yours, and does it have any significance in your life outside of research? I would say that I read that quote somewhere not in the primary source. I was not reading Faust uh, at the time, but I, I saw the quote and it immediately, immediately resonated with me. Initially, because of my uh, scientific work, because I had by then, I was probably mid-career, I had realized that if you're going to make a big discovery, uh, you're almost undoubtedly going to have to overturn some existing understanding or paradigm. And that takes what we call in Yiddish chutzpah. I don't know if you've ever heard the word chutzpah. Okay. It takes chutzpah, which is a form of boldness. It's sort of brazen gall. They say good definition of chutzpah is somebody who, having murdered both his parents, throws himself on the mercy of the court because he's now an orphan. That would be a uh, real chutzpah. Uh, so I realized that in scientific work, if you're going to make a 
big discoveries, you have to be bold. And that's what really uh, caught my attention. Uh, but the more I meditated over it, over the years, the rest of my life, the more I realized that, you know, in many aspects of life, the boldness often has to do with just initiating things. Uh, you know, people tend to procrastinate a lot, but the hardest part uh, uh, of anything is taking the first step. And once you take the first step, uh, it's interesting. You should look up the, the full quote. Uh, the lines that I often quote are really the end of the quote. Uh, but uh, basically, the fuller quote talks about the fact that once you initiate action, it says one, it's something along the lines of once you move, providence moves too. Mm. Uh, and then all sorts of things and circumstances and opportunities uh, arise that you never could have dreamed of. OK, and it goes on in that vein. But the key thing is the initiation, the will to start to actually do. And some people uh, are sorely lacking in that. They may have many other wonderful attributes. They may be very smart. They can come up with all kinds of ideas. But in terms of actually taking the first steps and saying, okay, let's just start this. Granted, we don't know quite what we're doing here yet, but that'll come later. Let's just do it. Uh, there are some people who can always think of 10 reasons why we shouldn't do that experiment. Uh, because it could never work. And there are other people who say, yeah, I know it's a long shot, but let's, let's give it a flyer. Uh, so I think that's what the meaning of that particular quote has been for me. That is really powerful. Just the, the meaning of momentum and where it will get you. Yeah, absolutely right. Amazing. So, I mean, you are a well-known mentor and clearly a fountain of good advice um, and someone who raised five children. Book Harvest works with a lot of parents and we try and enable them to provide that home literacy environment. Do you have any words of wisdom, although the last words that you just said were pretty good, um, for parents of young kids trying to get them to engage with books and engage with learning? Well, you know, it's interesting. As I think back to my children, one of the things they seem to love the most uh, is every night at bedtime, I would tell them stories. Uh, and uh, I would make them up right on the spot. Uh, I would use my imagination uh, uh, to just make up stories. Uh, and so I, I got them interested in stories. And then, of course, they wanted to read more stories. And well, I couldn't be there all the time. So I would tell them, well, you know, read these books. There are a lot of stories in there. My stories were always original. Uh, and I, I never knew where they were going. In some extent, it's like my research. Yeah, yeah I would start a story uh, and then I would see where it took me. Uh, and they loved them. And to this day, uh, some of them can repeat and do repeat. I remember one of the favorites, I have a daughter, Mara. Uh, and I remember making up a story about a little uh, girl named, uh, I gave her the same first name, Mara. But instead of Lefkowitz, I made up some some name, you know, Yankelwitz or something. And, and uh, we tied a balloon. Her parents had tied a balloon to her arm. Uh, and then a gust of wind came and it took her up in the air. Uh, and, and she landed in China on the other side of the world. OK. Uh, and I had her have all kinds of adventures there. And then, of course, another gust of wind came and blew her back. To this day, she's now turning 50 this year. She remembers that story, and there were others, you know, in the same vein. So I think I I try to inculcate in them uh, the idea of using one's imagination and stories, uh, and I think from that came came the reading. And they always saw me and their mother with a book in the hand. I mean, you know, uh, we didn't watch all that much TV. We watched some, of course, but yeah, to this day, everyone is a reader. Wow, it, it sounds like you have your idea for your second book. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Now you put it in my head. <laughs> Maybe your kids will help. It'll be a family, family activity. Well, one of the main things, we, I talk to each kid on average once a week. 
they have tend to have their time slots when they call that. Uh, so I always know exactly, well, it's Monday evening, I'm going to hear from so-and-so. But one of the things we often talk about is what they're reading. You know, uh, they look for ideas, things to read from me and, and vice versa. That's beautiful. I love that. Um, I do have one final question for you, a very important question. Um, you mentioned in one of your speeches that every night you have one square of 70% dark chocolate with almonds. Yes. Very important question is, do you yeah. have a favorite chocolate here? So that has evolved over the years. And I think you will read in the book a very funny story about how I credit my eating of dark chocolate for my winning the Nobel Prize. Mm -hmm. uh, but you'll, you'll have to read the book uh, to get that story. Uh, but these days, uh, so I, I only eat chocolate, which is 70% or greater uh, cocoa. Okay, so that's pretty dark. I, I don't go above 80 because then it gets a little too bitter for my taste. Uh, but uh, for years, I was moving from one uh, brand to another. And then one of my daughters, not, not Mara, a different one, uh, recommended something called Choco Love. See, it's chocolate only with a V instead of the T. Uh, and uh, I get it at Whole Foods. Uh, and they have a 77% dark chocolate, which is, I think, the best of anything that's that high uh, in, in cocoa that I've ever tasted. Uh, so that's what I've been doing for quite a while now. I absolutely love that i do the same thing i eat a block or a uh, not a block a square of dark chocolate every night as well it's a very healthy thing to do i can tell you as a cardiologist for many reasons perfect well maybe you'll give me that nobel prize someday too okay well read the book and you'll see what you need to do perfect well dr leskowitz thank you so much for taking the time to speak with me today it was it was a great honor it was my pleasure indeed Thank you. Be well. Okay. Bye-bye.